Okay, welcome back everyone to Inconceivable Media. I'm Cam. And I'm Miles. And we are finally wrapping up our discussion of Undone. We're going to do the last three episodes, six, seven, and eight. And we finally get to see, see if Alma can travel back in time. See if she can fix the timeline, which seems to be her entire goal, or at least what Jacob seems to think is her goal. So anyways, let's get right into it. Episode six, where we do not follow up immediately on Alma confessing to Sam. No, we're going to see what Camilla is up to instead. Yes. Let's check in on the wasp again. It's Easter time, so we get to see, I guess, how some people approach Easter egg hunting. I don't know about you. So like my parents, we had Easter eggs in the house that was just for us. I don't think we ever did anything that was for the community. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I remember a few times that there were things like that that we did, but it wasn't being held by like one mother. It was the community itself putting it all together. Mm -hmm. But yeah. we could also, it could also be the fact that she's has these, like the kids are wandering around trying to find Easter eggs and that, and she's uh, wants to help out in her own way. Well, maybe she doesn't actually put Easter eggs out for them. It's just the kids think that they're going to be out. Well, I mean, I could see that going either way, um, especially since when we come back to that the next day on Easter and the kids are there. And of course, Camilla's kind of really down in the dumps from what happened uh, at the end of the previous day. So... Who knows? Maybe she was actually going to put eggs out. I don't know. I just know that that struck me as something really weird because I don't. I, I it just I've I've never really heard of anything like that happening before. <laughs> well, I I do think it is something that does happen. I I don't know if one parent would be doing it for other kids, but like I could see a community doing it. Maybe she's heading some community thing, or she used to head some community thing, and they did that. Well, it's very true. And I mean, that that really works into what we see for the rest of the day when she is at the church and she's talking to various people, like when she was talking to the, <laughs> the one lady who uh, is on Weight Watchers. And what I don't remember exactly what it was that she said to her, but you just like had this comment. You were just kind of like, ah. Ah, uh, she's doing that thing again that that wasp moms do. <laughs> yeah, the you know she said, "Oh, you look great on Weight Watchers." And no, 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 no. She, no. She, she said, she, she said, she said "Your you smile." Look, yeah, you you look good, and the girl's like, "Oh yeah, I've been doing Weight Watchers." And she's like, "Oh no, it's that smile," you know, like taking the fact that she's been working so hard on her weight that she couldn't let her have that. Mm. Instead, she decides to compliment something else that she doesn't really have a whole lot of control over, you know. <sighs> It's basically saying, yes, hun, you failed. It's okay. You're still perfect the way you are. <laughs> well, and even... Um, how, do I, how do I say this? So, yeah, she goes back to uh, Father Miguel, and then she's just like, maybe you can help me out with Alma and try to get her to take her medication. It's, it's very interesting, all of the things that she does. You keep saying that she's just a wasp mom. And I'm just, there's something missing here, I think. Yeah, she is a wasp mom, Cameron. How do you not get this? Like, well, you got to remember that every time she says, I need help with this, mm -hmm. this isn't going my way. It's all about her. It's not about the people around her. And the only time it's about the people around her, it's to make her look better. It's. Again, it's not about the fact that she's helping the community. She's only doing that so that way she looks good. I suppose my issue is that I, it's still something that I didn't grow up with. So, I mean, I don't know. Maybe maybe it's she's just so good at it and it's being shown in such a realistic manner that it is hard for me to really truly get it because she is so good at manipulating she is really good at it. I mean... Some may call her a queen bee. Bees aren't wasps, Miles. Of course not. <laughs> <clears throat> Let me it... just bumble around out of that one. Well, an interesting thing uh, that we get when it comes to this, too, is that um, we also get to see Reed's parents again. I mean, 
this, the last time we saw them was like episode one or something like that. But we didn't really get to see them. But now we get to see them kind of more for real because um, they have like a, a mustard te- mustard tasting or something like that. And I guess we get to see the same type of parent, but the the white version, I guess. <laughs> Would you say that? Uh well, sure. I mean, I would argue that she's a better wasp mom. How uh, how so? Well, she's uh, she's willing to put down an idea in front of another person who's proposing it, and do oh. it in such a way that it's like, oh, you know, it. So Camilla ends up asking, like, oh, I want to do something. I want to help out here. You know, we. I still think that being married in a church is the traditional thing, and then. The mom goes, oh, there's nothing traditional about this wedding, which is like how you how one wasp mom would basically push down another one. Be like, oh, you care about traditions. (laughs) You're funny because your traditions aren't ours. So they're not actually really traditions, are they? Beth, that's uh, that's uh, that's her name. uh, Reed's mom. Yep. And kind of the interesting thing about that is that we get to see a whole lot of like casual racism in her interactions uh with camilla when they're ha- when they're doing the mustard tasting thing and like you're saying you know there's nothing traditional about this and in a way trying to just kind of spar with another wasp mom but at the same time also no the interesting thing that i found about this is that like in episode one when alma first talks about reed's parents she says there's nothing wrong with Reed. There's nothing wrong with his parents, despite the fact that they're super classist and they're also super racist. And she kind of says that in that kind of, you know, I'm going to try to step off from this because I know this is going to upset you, but the truth hurts and you need to hear it kind of way that Alma does things. And Becca's just kind of like, no, 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 you're wrong. And <laughs> then we get to see this and it's like, no. No, she was right. Ah, uh, yes, the racism <laughs> light, the comforting taste of your past. What? What do you mean by that? I mean, that's exactly what Beth is doing. You know, she's up oh. here on her pedestal, and she's making sure everybody else stays down, and only the people who are proper can go up with her. Ah, actually, that makes a whole lot of sense. Although it is interesting, you know, so Camilla goes from that one place where she takes a little bit of a, an L and but then she thinks that she's going to make back make it back up when she goes to do the, the, the Easter, the Holy Saturday Vigil, which she did manage to convince Alma to come to, despite the fact that Alma was like, mm, no, I want to do a different thing. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's also another textbook wasp mom thing to do where she kind of walked up and said, hey, come to this mustard tasting thing. It'll be fun. And she's like, oh, you know, I'll catch you on the next one. Oh, great. That's going to be next. That's going to be tonight. This candlelight vigil. I expect you to be there. And uh, we'll see you there. Um, just immediately, just like, like you're coming to this one, right? Yeah, exactly. Like not even <laughs> giving her a choice or a chance to say, oh, you know, I've got other things to do. It's you're coming, you're coming, you're coming. Bye. See you there. Bye. And yet it still doesn't, you know, I guess this just isn't Camilla's day because after the fact, uh, Father Miguel, you know, gets with her to talk to Alma about the medication. And then Alma is just like, oh, yeah, my medication, you know, the medication that is in my name. And you took my prescription and filled it without my consent and all this other stuff. And then Father Miguel's like, oh, OK, that's um, wow. <laughs> I was not prepared for this. And I think that uh, you are actually in the wrong on this one again this is what wasp moms do they they will take the narrative and Mm -hmm. only show you what they want you to see to help them or to do things for them and if you expose the whole narrative it totally destroys who they are (laughs) you know for five ten minutes they'll be back on their high horse in no time right very true Uh, You know, we should probably get back to talking about what happens to Alma. She she talked to Sam and she just came out and was just like, 
yes, I'm seeing my dead father, and he wants me to learn how to travel back in time and save him and all this other stuff. And so now we get to kind of see what the heck was actually going on. And again, the very, very different thing with this episode in particular is that we do not ever get to see what's in Alma's head, ever. When we're dealing with Sam and her, we're dealing with Sam's reactions to what she does. Um, like when... I think the term you're looking for here is this is a second, second person point of view. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, because we're not focusing on Alma's perspective anymore, which is kind of interesting. I mean, because you have said a whole lot of times about how you like the unreliable narrator aspect of it. And this is kind of nice because we are now really getting to see what happens for everyone who isn't Alma. Exactly. So we are breaking the normal mold of the unreliable narrator uh, to a point. I mean, some some things actually do show this. Mm -hmm. um, Hotline Miami does this on the second one. I don't think it's the first, but the second one, I'm pretty sure they did it. So yeah, it's a, it's a really good show of trying to like get that point of view of another person in. That's mm -hmm. why I say the second, uh, second person point of view mm -hmm. is because we are looking at somebody through the eyes of somebody else. Right. And very specifically at that particular person and how they're acting, right? Because yes. a lot of what we're seeing, especially when we're focusing on Sam, has to do with what is Alma doing and how does this play into his doubts and everything like that? I don't know. It's kind of interesting when it comes to Sam because I feel like the way the narrative, although then again, that's Alma's perspective, is that in a way we almost shouldn't really trust him anymore despite the fact that she has let him back in. So I, I feel that there's a few ways to look at it. One, when we see him acting the way he is, is that he is doing it out of fear that Alma, there's something truly wrong with her. But at the same time, I also, from a certain perspective, feel that he's trying to get control of her. I don't know if I agree with you on that. That's fine. But uh, I'm just, I'm like, just going I, out and just... I think that's what she thinks. I think that's what Alma does think. But... He's he's too much of like a pushover to do that to like way try too to much... manipulate her back that way. Yeah, I think he's too much of a, a pushover to do. I think if he tried to, it wouldn't it absolutely wouldn't work. And I think he knows that. Oh, OK, because he is I want to use the term sub. <laughs> uh, he's but... a, he's a beta male, is he? <laughs> <laughs> I don't like beta. I know, I know. But he's like, he's not the one in control of the relationship. I don't think he actually does want control of the relationship either. I think he just doesn't, uh, I just think he doesn't want it to change and it is changing. So he's scared. Fair enough. And now he has to try to do something. But of course, he doesn't have that, uh, he doesn't have the, that skill set. So he's working on, uh, well, on, I mean, on poor skills. <laughs> well, and, and in some ways, we kind of see that at the same time when they um, when they go to the university and they interact with the security guard to get um, the information about the uh, the break in on the Halloween night. You know why Jacob was called back to the office and potentially why he died. And, you know, Alma is like, I'll go in and do the talking. And then Sam's like, no, I'll go in and do the talking. I'm the more personable one. And Alma's like, uh-huh, yeah, sure, okay. <laughs> and, I mean, he, he does kind of flub it. <laughs> oh, he totally flubs it. <laughs> but this part here is actually very interesting uh, for me more because of the fact that, um, again, one of the reasons why I really like this podcast is that we get, you know, different interpretations of the same things happening, right? Um, <clears throat> but, you know, I like hearing that from other people too to kind of get their interpretations. And so <clears throat> in one of the preparations for this <laughs> back at like the beginning of the year, um, I watched a review of the show just to kind of see some other opinions. And some people had pointed out 
that when Alma does the whole look into your soul and see your entire past and life thing with the security guard, um, that she actually was observing everything that was around her. Sort of like what Sam says, where Sam was just like, wow, you were able to pick all that up just from, you know, a couple photos on her screensaver. And she's like, huh? No, I just, you know, saw her life. And they show a quick snap of all the photos and everything that she has on her desk. And the sister's name is on one of those photos. Now, I never noticed that ever. And I've watched this a few times. So someone pointed that out and they were using this kind of like to postulate, is she actually just schizophrenic and there is nothing happening or is, you know, was what she was saying was actually true? Who's to say? I just thought that that was kind of really interesting because I don't know, like Alma's body language doesn't make it seem to me like she noticed anything outside of the person denying her information. That's true, but the human mind works in weird ways. Mm -hmm. So honestly, I think she could have just been lucky with that. But uh... I mean, this is this is very true. Um that that she could have just been lucky and i mean that that's the that's the thing when it comes to cold reading and a lot of this other you know like the reality behind you know mind reading and soothsaying and all that stuff is that it comes down to how people react when you give when you throw out generic bits of information and well i don't know i mean the security guard was pretty stone-faced for most of it well, this is she, from... she did. She did give away a few things, but it took a while for Alma to get there. That's true. But, you know, this is from the outside perspective, but this still doesn't prove whether she's just schizophrenic or if she's gifted. Do you mean uh, in the perspective of we're not seeing inside Alma? We're just kind of observers outside of her head this time. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And it's. At the end of the day, even Rasputin was kill killed many times over, and we still don't really know what killed him, if anything did, if any of that did. That's a so that's actually not a bad point. <laughs> we have, you know, historical perspective on that, but even then, at least last time I heard, there it, something killed him, pretty sure. But what was it that happened? No one seems to really know. <laughs> I could be wrong on that. You know what? Uh, let's move on from that. Let, let's maybe not talk about something as dour as that. And instead, talk about episode seven, where we get the wedding. It's time for Becca's wedding, finally. Yay. Sure. But wait a minute. Doesn't Elma almost get abducted? I, well, I mean, she had it all planned out until she didn't by giving away way too much information when she was confronting Mr. Banderhorn. Yeah, well, she rolled pretty low on her bluff check. Like, all can't be acing in every rule. True, but I mean, at least she wasn't actually abducted or chopped up and left in a freezer or whatever the Global Creation Associates does with people that don't play ball. Well, first of all, the GCA would just make them cease to exist. That's oh. the way they would do it. But let's be honest here. There could have been a timeline where she was. That is very true. But um, let's get back to that uh, Global Creation Associates. What the <laughs> hell was up with that video they watched? I don't... <sighs> I don't know what to think. Every time I think about this show, I always think about that video in a way because there's something about it that just seems so real in that it is absolutely something that could have been made, but also something that I'm just like, this has to be fake. Like, there's no way they would be so blasé about that. I think it's a love letter to <laughs> corporal feudalism. That's what that is. What do you what do you mean by what do you mean by that? So corporal feudalism, for our listeners who don't, uh, who haven't heard this uh, sort of terminology coined together, it's, uh, it runs along the ideology of what came after democracy back in the fall of Rome. What comes after democracy was feudalism. Right. So there is a brief moment there where 
the people who had the power were actually the people who had the slaves because they were able to make and produce more using a very cheap workforce. Now, because of this cheap workforce, they got ahead a lot and they became not only, they kind of became their own fiefdom and eventually their own rulers. So it's kind of the lane blocks towards feudalism. So mm -hmm. something that some people are kind of talking about nowadays is we are, well, not we, but necessarily uh, more so America is heading towards the ideology of corporal feudalism, where the corporations are trying to buy land. And mm -hmm. there's actually a few people who have actually started to ask questions about this, where they will own the town and the people in there will work for them and they will do the taxes and they will do everything as they see fit uh, to rule over their own little, and I'll use this word again, fiefdom mm -hmm. or their own little yeah. plot of land. So, well, I mean, things like that are, are in a way, they, they just keep happening. I mean, company towns have been around forever. I mean, that's where we get such bangers like 16 tons and things like that from is from company towns in America in the 20th century. Yes. So it's sort of that little area between that and, uh, <laughs> this GCA is totally up that alley. Like It's just the 21st century version of it. Yes. I, I mean, the reason why I say about how like it's spooky because it feels so real, but also somewhat farcical, is that it again comes back to... like the, It's like the same thing when you see uh, certain things like that in BoJack Horseman, for example. Like... If we just think about, um, oh shoot, I can't remember what the chicken for days. I think was the you know the episode chicken for of, days, chicken for days. Yeah, yeah. Everybody's clicking for chicken for days. Yeah, <laughs> right. So I mean, they're it, not they're not like other chickens. Mm -hmm. These are genetically modified chickens, so they don't actually have a soul. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> oh. I, I remember when that episode, when that season came out and they did that episode, there were a bunch of people that were just kind of like, what was the point of this? This doesn't really add to the overall story, which is sort of true, except for the fact that it gives you a great world building and answers some questions that people probably didn't necessarily want answers to. Like with the fact that, hey, these are animal people and they're still eating food. Which includes where meat. did they get it from? Even though we also got that aside in the first season where a guy orders a steak and the cow waitress comes out and she's like, here's your steak. And he's like, uh, sorry. And she's like, uh, -huh. so <clears throat> again, seeing that. as how the same creative minds behind Bojack Horseman gave us this, that was where I was just kind of like, this is one of those moments where, well, I don't know. Undone is still definitely not anywhere near as funny as BoJack Horseman was, because that's not the point. <laughs> but then you have little moments like that where you're just sitting there going, I'm scared. <laughs> don't hug me, I'm scared, Cameron. Don't hug me, I'm scared. I don't, I don't know, know, have you seen that show? No, I haven't. No, but I, I I, have heard of it. I know what you're talking about. I, I haven't seen it, though. We'll have to throw that one on the list, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> we'll get around to it. It's... Ah. We should probably move away from talking about this because who knows who might be listening to our podcast one day. We don't want to upset any corporate overlords ourselves. <clears throat> so the wedding in which we get to see Alma screw up the timeline again. But then she fixes it. Again? Well, she fixes it. I feel like this was sort of rushed. Like we needed this to happen so that we know Alma was ready to, to go to the next stage. Mm -hmm. But I just felt like that it, that they were cramming it in and trying to speed everything up a lot more. And it, it just doesn't feel right. I think maybe part of that, too, is that despite the fact that we are back to Alma's perspective for this, it's very different from what it's been in the previous episodes when it's her perspective. She just goes into a fog because she knows she screwed up. And she's like, I need to fix this. And then she just Whoa, does it. And we're all just like, what the? We didn't get to see you plan this out or anything like that. Like what you've previously done. You just, you can do this now? I guess so. So we can see that her trigger to do this is anxiety. Got it. <laughs> anxiety. The new human superpower. 
Well, don't tell God this because we all know the angels are like, look at what you did, God. You made man and it's got anxiety. <laughs> it has existential dread. What are you doing? I it's mean, broken now. Well, you are you are definitely not wrong about that. But, I mean, we see as the wedding goes on, and then when she goes and she talks with uh, with the dancer that was also at the same um, conference, well, at the same hotel that the wedding was happening at, and she talks about how, oh, you know, you have our heritage as well, so you know the dance because it's part of you. But by connecting to her ancestors, she gets that spark that she needed. So it's not just the anxiety. It's then it's another Anne. It's her ancestors that help her jump into the past. I just had to do that. <laughs> I feel like there's another good Anne joke I can throw in here. <laughs> she she needs to step away from this bland wedding. Yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah. We'll we'll take it. <laughs> so, uh with that, we jump into the final episode where she goes back to the past to see what actually happened. I mean, technically you could say she went hand first. Hey, there we go. That's better. That's better. <laughs> um, we can just cut to the chase here uh, when it comes to what she actually learns. So, I mean, wait, wait, literally? I, I mean, I don't have a knife on me or anything like that. Although she does get a nice cut on her head from, you know, jumping into a mirror. But, you know, that that's a little after, you know, she has to fix the past, but not before learning about what actually happened in that her father wasn't murdered. Turns out he was just an asshole and he decided to go the murder-suicide approach himself. Aha! Self, self high five. <laughs> Knew he was the villain after all. I was trying to hold that in every time you kept bringing that up in the other discussions and I'm just like, he's technically correct. The best kind of correct. <laughs> like he's not, he's not evil, right? Well, let's be honest here. Who is actually evil? I know. People just kind of get caught up in the moment things happen. And the next thing you know, 40 million Jews die. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Or, or, you know, you start a hundred year crusade. Yep. Yeah. Or you have 80 million people die through purges, through famines, through all sorts of things. Yeah. <laughs> Next thing you know, Ukraine is being told <laughs> not to, you know, resort to cannibalism. But you got a, you got something to do, and you're really focused on that. I wasn't sure if you were going to keep talking about Holodomor or if you were going to talk about what's happening right now. <laughs> I, I don't want to date it too much. I don't know. It's actually kind of really spooky to think about the fact that some of the collectivization and everything happened like in the 20s, and here we are like 100 years later. Russia's going back to keep... Stepping around in Ukraine again. Um, although that is something that is still beyond the purview of this podcast, I think. So, I mean, g guess going back to, uh, again, talking about what we see there. It's interesting because Jacob continues to act like he doesn't know what happens. So another interesting thing from one of those other reviews that I saw was that they were saying that the fact that until this moment when suddenly he's like, oh, I don't want you to see this, you know, I can undo everything so that you don't have to go through this, that uh, some people were saying that part of the fun about this is that the reason why she doesn't believe that Daryl is an actual person's name or why it's Vanderhorn, but it turns out it's actually Vanderhorn and things like that is because it's not her dad that's actually talking to her. It is her just trying to figure out what the heck is spinning around in her head. And as she learns more information from reading stuff, it starts to fill in certain blanks. And that's why she thinks her father was murdered 
not that he killed himself. And it's also why the manifestation of him is like, I was murdered and you need to stop my murder. So, I mean, I don't feel that way. I certainly do feel that he probably, like you were saying, he is, he is the antagonist. He is withholding information from her because when they find out about it, he's just like, here, you know, take a right at the at the red light and you're not going to get in the accident and this will never happen. What do you think? Too little, too late. I mean, you got to kind of look at it from the time traveler perspective of it all. <laughs> where like, they open this can of worms. It's not like doing this is going to fix it. And on top of that, saving himself means that Alma probably will not learn how to do all of this technique and that, and everything's going to be different. Right. Or, like, there's going to be even more different challenges, and he might not be able to overcome them. So, therefore, it would literally be writing her out of being able to do all this. Mm -hmm. So there's a huge lap in the whole time distortion thing that they're not really accounting for, I would say. Well, I don't know. I mean, would you then say that maybe this is correct in that the reason why Jacob doesn't always have the right information to give her in the previous episodes when he's training her is because he's not real, that this is not real? Again, it definitely could be. That's mm -hmm. more proof of the fact that she might be schizophrenic. Right, as opposed to just being gifted, right? Yes, but let's give let's give some credit here to the kids because oh, <laughs> when she know, comes back, <laughs> yeah, and she comes back, and everybody's standing around her, and the kids are like, "Yeah, she totally just ran into that mirror like head first, like no idea what's going on." But you know, that's that's one thing adults don't have that kids do, and that's honesty. Yeah, I adults can... need a little bit more honesty. Yeah, I can see that. Yeah. I mean, well, I mean, Alma thinks that she has fixed everything, which, of course, is why she wakes up. Right. You know, she she, she fixed it or she she forced her father to fix it or I don't know, timey wimey things happened. And well, I mean, the funny thing about that is that when she wakes up, I guess she has to face the consequences of her actions because Tunde is just like, OK, this is strike five, six, seven, eight. We have long run out. Like, you got to go. This is not okay. You need help. <laughs> and I don't know how to help you. And I'm probably not equipped to help you. And I don't know. Alma is still kind of in that denial stage. Because despite the fact that it really much is looking like her life is just going to fall apart, she still thinks that she succeeded. Uh, you know, when she's confronted by her mom because Sam ratted on her about everything, even the pills. And then she's just like, you know what? When the timeline resolves itself, I'll never have met you people and all that stuff. And just takes her mom's car keys and just goes away to Mexico to solve the to fix everything again once and for all. So I'm really surprised that her mom didn't call the cops on her. But I guess maybe Becca stepped in to stop this. I mean, she had to kind of get away from her own problems too, right? Becca did tell. Oh, um, yeah, right. Because she, she told Reed and then Reed told his parents. And then her parents were just like, well, this is as good an excuse as we'll ever get to not make this look like a race thing. Pretty much, yeah. <laughs> We're not racist, so, you know, she she's just a bad person, just like all the other Mexicans. Oh. Uh, Although, I mean, technically, they're not racist if they're the best, right? That is definitely something that people say. It's not really something that I believe. No, I don't either. It's just... <laughs> Although, you raise a good point about the car that wasn't something that occurred to me is that you're right they're in san antonio so it probably takes like a good hour to drive to the border and that's even first getting out of san antonio in the first place which is probably a nice long 30 40 hour long commute as it is yay highway system of the u.s <laughs> regardless 
you raise a good point. If she wanted to stop her from going to Mexico, she could just call the cops. She got good. plenty of time to do that. But she didn't, which uh, I don't know. You're you're more of the uh, <laughs> an expert on wasp moms. Do you feel that maybe that is a way to try to bring her back into her good graces by not going that approach? Mm, not really. No, really. I uh, I don't think. Uh... I think she was probably going to call the cops, but, uh, you know, before she did so, she had to, of course, tell uh, her good daughter about everything that's happening. Right. And then her daughter's like, okay, I've got a reason to get out of this whole thing because... I got my own things. Yeah, I've got got my own shit to deal with, and Mm -hmm. I don't want to be here right now, so I'm going to leave too. Yep. Don't worry, Mom, I'll go get her. (laughs) Look at me being the great daughter I am. No, uh, no other motives here at all. (laughs) By the way, I'm getting divorced. Bye. (laughs) (laughs) And, and, and that's where we end it too. You know, uh, Becca shows up and talks to Alma and Alma is just like, you know, it's actually kind of interesting because Becca actually says what you had said when we were uh, talking about the second batch of episodes where you were saying, it's not that I have to believe the person myself. It's that I have to believe that they believe it because that's what, because Becca says that she says, I believe that you believe it in that, you know, dad's going to come back and she's just like honest, but still, you know, let's just, let's just go back to the car Let's go back home. We still have life to deal with. And there's nothing that can really change that. And then we are left with a cliffhanger worthy of a Christopher Nolan film. If you say so. But I think the best cliffhangers will always come from M. Night Shyamalan. I thought his whole thing was twists, not necessarily cliffhangers. I don't know. He's usually pretty good about explaining everything. <laughs> at the end and just being very much as like oh no 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 here's all the answers to the riddles of the movie <laughs> right so did they show that it wasn't aliens invading it was actually demons oh in signs no yep. uh, yeah that that was aliens that was well i mean they said it was aliens we never got to see any ufos but they seem to make the implication that it was aliens the whole time but you do remember that the water that was hurting the aliens was actually blessed by the daughter. <laughs> oh, man. And he does go back and, you know, continue becoming a a, a, a priest after that, too. <laughs> oh, so man, that's funny. I've got a question to bring yeah. us back on top of, of this. Is this now going to be called redoing? House... Oh, because of the fact that she goes back and she fixes the timeline? Yeah, because we know that there's a second season coming out. I mean, I don't think Undone should be a good name for it. I think it should be called Redoing. Redoing or like something mm, along that line? Um, I don't, I don't know because I haven't watched the second season just yet. Uh, so I'm not sure what they're going to do about this, but... Well, gee, man, you kind of gave it away. Although, then again, if you're listening to this podcast at this point, and that means you have checked out the show, that means that, yes, you know, (laughs) it got a second season. (laughs) Yes. Well, we did mention that last time, too, I think. Did we? I I think so. Maybe. Time is weird. Even you're telling Alma. (laughs) But, yeah, that's it. Uh, At least for the first season of Undone. What did you think? I thought it was a pretty good show. I quite enjoyed it. Mm -hmm. I'd actually definitely recommend this for people. Yeah. Like, oh, yeah. Especially now at this point, you're just like, oh, man, people need to watch this. It's definitely one to watch if you want to sit and ponder about a show, which is one of my favorite things to do. Mm -hmm. Uh, One thing I think we should get you to watch is Centaur World for that. Okay. Uh, I, some, I mean, it's not that I hesitate because I am. I know about that show, and that is one of those shows where I have seen promos for it, and I'm just sitting there going, I don't know. I don't think I should watch that show alone. 
You know, I uh, I almost agree with you, except I did start to watch it alone. And then, of course, my girlfriend comes in and goes, what the hell are you watching? And I go, I'm not totally sure yet. I'm very confused. Let's watch this together and figure it out. And we did. And we both loved it. We thought it was absolutely amazing. Um, especially since, like, if you if you watch anything of the show, you're probably getting what I call the center of the show. You're not getting the bread. You're getting all the meat. And uh, the bread of the show makes it totally worth it. This is like... I used to always have my sandwiches as white bread. <laughs> And then you found out that there are other grains in the world or actual grains. Yeah, that, and then I found out that there's actually, there's this thing called grain. You know, it, it kind of makes the flavor a lot better. Totally so it doesn't... changes your, uh, your uh, toasted sandwich, which yep. is like two pieces of bread with a piece of toast in between. So, uh, mm. you know, I, uh, I feel like that in this case, in Centaur World, the bread absolutely makes this show. All right. And you're going to have to get through the terribleness in the middle, which is probably something resorting to, I don't know, cheese whiz with raspberry jam. That's a very interesting combination. Oh, could... it is. The show is a very interesting combination together as well. But we'll can, get into that for I can, our next one. I can just, I can almost taste that texture in my mouth. I don't, I don't, I'm not liking that. It's okay, you can drink after this. <laughs> you can just drink that one out of your memory banks. <laughs> okay, so coming back to talking about Undone. So what were some things that, that you really enjoyed about it? So the character, or the cast for this show is really, really good. I mm -hmm. really like the cast and how they portray their characters and how their characters are like, they are kind of growing Mm -hmm. Maybe not the right ways, but they are still growing, which I really do enjoy. And uh, well, they are dealing with the situations at hand. They're not just pushing them back or like forgetting about them. They're actively watching, especially with uh, Sam and Alma. Mm -hmm. Sam is actually watching her being like, whoa, what's going on here? And then he even goes through and does the research and be like, hey, look, all of these things are actually... This like, is a warning sign. Yeah, these are warning signs for schizophrenia. So I really enjoyed all that. I thought it was really good. Is there, well, and, I all, and you've already said many times about how awesome the rotoscoping is. Yes, rotoscoping is very good. I love it. I understand why the second season took so long to come out. Because <laughs> it's a very difficult thing you have to do. Because you have to do all of the filming and then you have to paint over it all frame by frame. Mm -hmm. And you can kind of tell with this show uh, that they are cutting the frames back. So that way they don't have to paint as many. But it's okay. I mean, you have to accept that with rotoscoping. It's just how it is. Well, I mean, with the fact that there's a second season out, one thing I'm going to be interested to see is... I mean, because this is something that you always get when, it, especially when it comes to animated shows, like the first time you watch, uh, you know, the first maybe handful of episodes, like the pilot and maybe the first three episodes that were ordered or something before they got a full season. And then even then sometimes just the whole first season is not great because maybe you're doing a new uh, cell shading process or something, or you're experimenting with frames, like how many, you know, how many frames per second you're going to be using or something like that. And it ends up coming out kind of rough. And then you know what you're doing. You have a nice uh, animation team that understands the process and everything like that and then you get your second season and now everyone's like oh yeah we know what we're doing we we have the technology developed for it this is not going to take as many man hours to do it and therefore we can polish it now because we can redistribute those uh those man hours that would have been just put to oh we need to get this done oh god this is so hard yeah sometimes you got to be really careful of mixing uh other people's nagoids with your pausons so you got to make sure you keep those separated. <laughs> so is there anything that stood out in this that you didn't enjoy? Hmm. 
feel like there is something there that I didn't quite enjoy. I don't really enjoy the whole timeline play thing, I guess you could say. Mm -hmm. Just because it's always so erratically different from every other timeline thing, but at the same time, it's always similar. So do and you that's... mean when she, like when she's futzing with the keys and things like that, or like when she was back in the hospital and she was going back and forth and having to replay everything over and over until she finally got gets to wake up? That, um, that sort like of the... stuff? Yeah, like it, it wasn't consistent. Mm. I feel it wasn't consistent. Like they're trying to find out how this works while they were making the episodes. Um, <laughs> like I don't blame them for this at all because time travels a lot like magic in books. Mm, right. So yes. you do have your two schools of quote unquote magic. Right. Which is your hard magic and your soft magic. Yeah. And your hard magic has like very intense rules and mm -hmm. this is what it can do and it can't go past that. Mm-hmm. And then your soft magic is like, I would say it's very much the fantasy of Star Trek where it's, oh, we can solve this problem by doing this thing and this thing and make a simple analogy and then everything's okay. We when... can fix it for this episode. Exactly. We can <laughs> fix it for the episodes, but I feel like they're trying to jump back and forth between those, which again, really presses me to think that she's actually schizophrenic because she doesn't understand how it works and... I mean, if you're going to do something with time travel, uh, you got to have your hard, your hard fantasy with that mm -hmm. in order to make that make sense. So I feel like, I don't know. Sorry, Alma. I don't think I'm rooting for you. <laughs> well, I don't, well, I don't know. I don't think there's anything wrong if you're not necessarily, well, when you say you're not rooting for her, do you mean that in the sense that you're sitting there going, hmm, I feel like maybe if we continue this on to a second season, we're just going to be absolutely inside Alma's head and then everyone else in the outside world is like, oh, no, oh, no, oh, no. And and like it, it really is like, you know, she thought dad was going to come back inside the cave and everything. And nope, that's that's not real. Yeah, I don't think it's real. I think everybody else is trying to deal with her. I think that's what it's going to be. That's my prediction, but well, I we'll mean, have to find out. we'll have to find out when it comes to that. But honestly, that is one of the things that I like about the show and the reason why I, I guess the reason why I've watched it three, I guess probably will be four times <laughs> by the time I watch it again in preparation for season two. <laughs> Um, is, I don't know, that ambiguity, I really like that because it's one of those things that I could see it breaking either way. And I do feel confident that if, when they make a decision on which way they want it to break, that they will know exactly the story that they want to tell and that they will... They will still curate it in such a way that will be will be accepted by both camps. Like I feel that there is a way to just sort of like people in real life that do suffer from this, that what's going on in their head might not be what's happening in reality. But so long as they're surrounded by people that are taking care of them and are trying to stop them from, you know, hurting themselves and others, then it, it, will, it will be okay. It's not going to be perfect, but... It will be manageable. It will be manageable. Yeah, exactly. Fair enough. And also, I just like the fact that our focal character is someone who has potentially like a major mental illness. That is just something that does not happen. Oh, obviously you haven't seen Cube. Uh, yes, I have, but 
now I'm sitting here going, uh, yeah, that's, well, okay, sure. <laughs> uh, I mean, that's like saying that Dustin Hoffman in Rain Man is like the focal character, despite the fact that Tom Cruise is the one that probably it gets more screen time. <laughs> Have you not seen Rain Man? No, I have. Oh, I'm, okay. I'm thinking about that. <laughs> I'm, I'm thinking Tom Cruise does have more, more screen time. The, the show was about Tom Cruise. Despite the fact that it's called Rain Man, which is referring to his brother. Yeah. Who's the autistic one. Yeah, that's because the whole story is about him having to deal with his brother. So how is that different than Cube? Because he he's not... He's the one who gets out of the Cube, yes, but screen time is kind of shared equally through everybody else in the Cube. He's you know, every time as they die. Lived. Well, okay, sure. I'll I'll buy that interpretation. Okay, well, I think that's all for tonight, guys. Uh, yeah, you don't have any final thoughts on? Uh, oh, something that we've never really talked about with this is the music. What did you? But the other thing about that, and I just really quickly want to mention this because you've never really mentioned it before. And you usually do talk about music. The music blended really well with this is mm -hmm. what I have to say about it. Because like, I usually bring music up in my points when I'm hosting mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. it's one of the things that I have on my list of things we must talk about. So I feel that in this case... The music really blended with it. So I'm going to say it did a good job mm -hmm. because it really helped heighten the highs and lower the lows. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, if you say, oh, please explain, I won't be able to give you an example. That's... It's just the way that it is. It, uh, it did exactly what it needed to do. And that is perfectly fine. I mean, the music, it, <laughs> it's kind of funny, you know, the musician did not decide to focus necessarily on the music. However, the music is really great. Amy Doherty did a stupendous job with everything that was done, like all of the atonal and discordant stuff that happened whenever Alma was going through any kind of hardship or when she, when her world was starting to kind of break apart and things like that and all of the kind of chaotic music that went along with it i mean i love the music in this because like you said it blends so well into the world and just is makes this really nice whole and well actually is just kind of another color in the palette uh that this is and I just kind of wanted to quickly bring it up with you because, again, you never mentioned it, which was surprising to me because music does stick out to you. It does. And that, you know, your whole thing there actually totally reminds me that I don't think I've ever told you this, but uh, art is the color of, of a space, whereas music is the color of time. Hmm. No, I don't think you've ever said that to me. Yes. I like that. <laughs> I'm going to hold on to that one. But when it comes to this composer, I will say that she's not in Kansas anymore. Yeah, so we've come to the end of Undone. We have finished yet another show all about... <laughs> and I only did one <laughs> reference to Weezer. <laughs> yep. <laughs> God, I feel like you probably could have found something, some some way to tie that into our conversations for every other episode. I fear the day that we do a show that you can do that with like another band, because then I'll just be like, oh no. <sighs> Shall we do this as Spinal Tap? <laughs> I mean, we could, but I feel like we'd have to bring somebody else into that who has never seen it before. Yeah. Hmm, might have to ask like if Gareth or Kimmy or... Maybe, Maybe. Uh, we'll find out. Yeah. We'll but, find somebody. Yep. In the meantime, though, I'm Cam. And I'm Miles. And we'll see you next time. <laughs>